Hey kids, what time is it? It's howdy duty time. It's howdy do. Okay, you know what time it is. It's Saturday morning. There's no school. It's time to load up on sugary cereal and colorful cartoons made just for you. That's what it was like in 1991 when I was four years old. The imperfect way that the cartoons were colored and drawn back then, it was so charming. There's beauty in the imperfections. In the 1991 to 1992 era, my favorite cartoons to watch were Eek the Cat, Bobby's World, and you guessed it, Back to the Future, the animated series. I noticed that a lot of people either don't know that this existed, or knew but didn't really like how it came out. And today, we're going to take a closer look at this little paradox of a series. So sit back, relax, grab a box of Back to the Future cereal, yeah, they really made that, and let's take a look at the chaotic past of Back to the Future, the animated series. Back in the 80s and 90s, us kids were used to being introduced to movie franchises through the medium of Saturday morning cartoons. Some of them were very unexpected. You had Police Academy, Dumb and Dumber, The Mask, Ace Ventura, Karate Kid, Men in Black, Robocop, Rambo, Teen Wolf, and one based on Godzilla 98 just to name a handful. With Back to the Future ending its trilogy run in 1990 with part three, it seemed like we would be saying goodbye to Marty and Doc for the foreseeable future. But the future is what you make it. So Universal Cartoons decided to make the future animated. In 1990, they contacted Back to the Future co-writer and producer Bob Gale to see if he would be interested in making an animated show based on the popular series. He in fact was interested. This shouldn't come as a surprise as Gale has devoted his career to mostly Back to the Future content. After Back to the Future Part 3, he's only written six non-Back to the Future projects out of 34 credits. The movie Trespass, an episode of Tales from the Crypt, Tattoo Assassins, which is an unreleased video game, an interactive movie game called Mr. Payback, Bordello of Blood, which he received a story by credit, and Interstate 60, which he also directed. I'm just curious why he hasn't made more original stuff. He's responsible for one of the greatest trilogies of all time. I pictured him doing a lot more. Anyway, I'm getting off topic. His demands for Back to the Future the Animated Series was this. It had to have Christopher Lloyd, and he wanted it to have educational content throughout. Producers John Luden and John Loy hopped on board and got to work writing a few scripts to pitch to Gale. This pair had previously worked together as writers on another time travel movie turned animated series with Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventures. When Loy and Luden narrowed their script ideas down to one about Jules and Byrne being on opposite sides of the Civil War, Gale read it and threw it in the trash right in front of them. He told them that they had to do much better than that. So they went back to the drawing board or writer's room or whatever and tinkered with different ways of approaching it. Apparently, Gale didn't like the idea of the show revolving around Emmett Brown's children. He thought it should focus on Doc and Marty going on adventures. The problem was, Luden and Loy had tried that, but it always came back to the issue of Doc and Marty's character arcs from the movies. In an article written by Brian Van Hooker of the website Fatherly, it had an interview with John Luden explaining the predicament. We developed three or four different ways to go with this series, but none seemed to be able to go beyond a few episodes except for the one based around the two kids. In the films, Doc and Marty had just been on a number of adventures spanning from 1885 to 2015, so it made little sense to have either of those characters suddenly become reckless with time travel, especially on a weekly basis. But with impulsive children, they could get into all kinds of trouble and it would be up to Doc and Marty to help them out of it. This makes sense. When I was a kid, I also wondered why it wasn't mostly about Doc and Marty. I mean, that's what the fans of the movies really wanted, right? But I guess if you overthink it, it doesn't really make sense that the cartoons backtrack on the arc that our heroes learned from the trilogy. Although we're talking about a cartoon that has a dog driving a time machine train and Doc getting sucked into a video game, but still. When John Luden and John Loy made a few minor tweaks to their original script and explained the predicament they were up against, Bob Gale realized they were right and gave them the go-ahead. Are you sorry, Bob? You got leftover pizza grease all over their perfectly good script. 
The animated series follows Doc, Clara, and Jules and Vern in modern-day Hill Valley on their farmland. Doc has recreated the destroyed DeLorean from Back to the Future Part 3. It now features a voice-activated assistant and can float on and beneath water. It can also fold into a gravity-defying suitcase. It's more like the car from Chitty Chitty Bang Bang now. The awesome time travel train has also returned. Marty McFly is back, although in more of a supporting role this time. Biff also returns, mostly as various ancestors in the never-ending Tannin lineage of Hill Valley. What am I saying? He also has lineage in ancient Rome for some reason. This time around, the time machines can teleport to different locations on Earth, as opposed to just Hill Valley, which doesn't make much sense, but cartoon. Once the script was approved, it was time to figure out some logistics. Who would the cast consist of? Well, Gail roped in Christopher Lloyd just like he had wanted to. However, Lloyd was busy with a bunch of other projects at the time, so he only committed to appearing in the live action sequences that occurred before and after the animated parts. These parts were filmed quickly on a tight schedule. Lloyd would directly address the camera, and anytime he would make mistakes, they wouldn't cut, they'd just keep rolling, and he'd redo the lines on the spot. Since a lot of retakes weren't possible, they would employ this glitchy transition style and a technical difficulty screen with Doc on it to cut around this issue. Michael J. Fox was also too busy to lend his voice to the show, not to mention he was secretly battling the early stages of Parkinson's disease. They scored the very talented voice of Dan Castellaneta for the animated version of Doc Brown. Castellaneta is the voice of everyone's favorite yellow doofus from the gigantic, never-ending animated series, The Simpsons. Years later, he would also replace Robin Williams when he declined to return for the sequel to Aladdin. Also returning was Mary Steenburgen in the role of Clara. Some people in the comments of my video, The Chaotic Past of Back to the Future Part 3, brought to my attention that it's pronounced Mary Steenburgen, and that I should be ashamed of myself for pronouncing it Bergen. Are we clear now? Okay. In addition to the awkward moment that John Luden had with Bob Gale and his script in the trash moment, he also had two more awkward encounters with cast members. When he met Christopher Lloyd for the first time, he found out that Lloyd had a house in Montana. Well, Luden also recently bought a house in Montana, so he saw a way of relating to the actor. He walks up to Lloyd and says, Mr. Lloyd, it's a pleasure to meet you. I'm really excited that you're working on this project. And in fact, I just bought a house in Montana. And Christopher Lloyd's smile faded and he said, in classic Doc Brown fervor, My ex-wife got that house! They didn't talk about Montana again. When Luden met Steenburgen, he greeted her by saying, Oh, Mary, thank you for doing the show. I saw you in time after time and I just fell in love with you. And she replied, Yes, I made the same mistake with the leading man of that movie. She was referring to her ex-husband, Malcolm McDowell, who she married after meeting on that movie. So yeah, Johnny Boy learned to never bring that up again either. It's so funny what this teaches us. Just stick to the work, get your actors in and out, and don't suck up. Marty was voiced by actor David Kaufman. He's a prolific on-camera actor and voiceover artist who had been deep into commercial work at the time. He was doing an audition at the same office as casting director Danny Goldman, who was also the voice of Brainy Smurf. David was walking by Danny's office and said hello, and Danny stopped him and had him read lines for a show he was casting. David realized it had something to do with Back to the Future because the name Doc showed up more than a few times. Anyway, he gave it his best shot and read the lines. Goldman let him know that, with a little more work, his voice had the right characteristics for a Michael J. Fox type. Kaufman was used to this by now, as he was frequently going out for roles that called for a Michael J. Fox type. He went in one more time to officially audition, and he got the part. He did a great job as the voice of Marty McFly, I must say. Years later, he would once again replace Michael J. Fox's voice in the Stuart Little cartoon series. Tom Wilson also returned to the role of Biff Tannen for the show. After the end credits of every episode, Biff does a little comedy routine before getting hurt in some way. This played off of the fact that in real life, Tom Wilson is a stand-up comedian. On the live action side of things, Bill Nye would also join the cast, but we'll get back to that in a bit. Scripts had to be pumped out fast to get this show on the air by September of 1991. Peyton Reed had been hired to direct all the live action sequences for it. Reed got his start directing the behind the scenes material for Back to the Future 2 and 3. 
He had also directed the video, The Secrets of the Back to the Future Trilogy. You know, the one that had Kirk Cameron answering fan mail in the Old West? Reed would go on to direct all three of the Ant-Man movies for Marvel Studios starting in 2015. Anyway, directing the live-action stuff for the Back to the Future, the animated series, was a big deal for him. He was also trying to get into writing as well, so producer John Luden offered him the opportunity to write three or four of the live-action sequences. Peyton was given a deadline but didn't deliver, so Luden kept pressing to get the script. When Peyton finally handed it in, Luden gave him a soft scolding about how he really needed the script on time. Well, Peyton was very honest about why he didn't meet the deadline. He said, there was a Planet of the Apes marathon, I, I couldn't miss it. Honesty, it will set you free. It'll also set you free from writing any more of the scripts for that season. Peyton didn't return for season two because he was on to other projects by then. Bob Gale directed season two's live action sequences. Usually in animated shows, the cast records their lines separately from each other, but for this show, they were all in the same room recording together. This gave the show a more energetic feel to it. It also helped the actors with chemistry, although it took much longer than regular shows would. Each episode was done in this style. What's the deal with Bob Gale and his insistence on educational segments for the series? Well, when he was a kid, he used to watch a popular show in the 50s called Watch Mr. Wizard. It featured a science hobbyist played by creator Don Herbert who would do experiments for his neighbors. There's even an episode in the Back to the Future animated series called Put on your thinking caps, kids. It's time for Mr. Wisdom. It's about Doc Brown's old roommate who becomes the host of a kid's science show. It's revealed that Mr. Wisdom stole one of Doc's inventions to win a science fair. Anyway, it was like an evil version of Mr. Wizard. Well, it turns out that Mr. Wizard inspired Bill Nye the Science Guy, who, by the way, got his start on, you guessed it, wrong. It wasn't the Back to the Future cartoon. Nope, he got his start on the Seattle comedy sketch show, Almost Live. Bill Nye, a mechanical engineer from Washington, D.C., would show up from time to time doing the lovable scientist character you know from Bill Nye, the science guy, and Back to the Future, the cartoon. Oh, and as Speedwalker, which no one seems to talk about anymore. He's a character that fights crime while adhering to the standards of competitive speedwalking. When Nye was cast on the Back to the Future animated series, he wouldn't talk. He would just show different science demonstrations based on things from the episode we just watched. In 1993, Bill Nye the Science Guy debuted, and the rest is science. Universal Cartoons, now known as Universal Animation Studios, committed to two seasons of the show. They also canceled it directly after fulfilling those two seasons, consisting of 26 episodes. They did this due to low ratings. I loved the show when I was younger. It was refreshing to see my favorite characters again after the movies ended. As kids, we didn't take these cartoons too seriously. We knew that it would take liberties with the movie's rules and broaden them for our sugar-filled minds. Having said that, I bought the DVD last year and watched all the episodes. Some are fun, others are sort of just filler. They go back to the 1800s seven different times. As a kid, that's the last place you want to see them go, at least in my opinion. I always wanted to see the future at that age. They only do that once. Jules and Vern give their parents two tickets to a space cruise in 2091 as an anniversary present. My dad used to record some of the episodes on VHS, so those episodes are burnt into my head. The one where they go to ancient Rome and get caught up in a Ben-Hur inspired chariot race. <laughs> and Doc eats spaghetti, which always made me kind of hungry. I really like the one where they alter history and save the dinosaurs from a meteor. When they get back to an alternate version of 1991, the world is inhabited by dinosaurs. They must undo their mistake in the past and let the meteor strike Earth as planned, which causes the death of a friendly pterodactyl named Donnie. Vern is saddened by this, but they meet a very distant relative of Donnie's in present day. I also like the Salem Witch Trials episode where Marty gets on the bad side of that time period's version of Biff Tannen. Marty rejects his daughter, Mercy, and she gets mad and accuses him of being a witch. So they sink him to the bottom of the lake. Of course, he escapes without them knowing, and they all learn an important lesson about judging others. Remember kids, judgment can get you drowned and murdered. One of my favorite Bill Nye experiments is when he makes a homemade cannon with vinegar, baking soda, an empty soda bottle, and a cork. I should actually try that out later today. Honorable mentions go to the plastic cup telephone 
and the invisible ink with lemon juice. In the show, Marty is also kind of a douchebag from time to time. In the movies, he's more loyal to Jennifer. In the show, he's always ready to have a jaunt with some other girl, whether it's in his own time period or in the past. He even gets jealous when he misunderstands Jennifer helping out a jock at school. But anyway, he usually comes around, but they make him into a simp, and I think that does our boy Marty a disservice. There's also an episode where Jules and Vern enter into Doc's imagination, and it's interesting, but makes no sense. Again, it's just a little too outlandish for a show based on a movie that was surprisingly grounded apart from its time travel elements. Why am I picking apart a kid's cartoon? Because it's YouTube. Regardless, I look back on this show with a lot of warmth and fondness. It takes me back to a wholesome time where kids just wanted to hang out in a colorful animated world with characters from their favorite movies. And for that, I'm grateful. Thanks for watching. I'm Scotty D. If you enjoyed this video, you can go back to the future with this series that I've created for your viewing pleasure. See you next time, slackers. Yeah.